Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the NPTEL Massive Online Open Course on Phonetics and Phonology, a broad overview. And we are continuing with our Unit 7 where we have talked about phonological alternations, about um, finding underlying representations, about ordered rules. And in this section, we will continue with those discussions and not just talk about phonetic alternations, uh, phonemic alternations, but also look at what happens when there is a lot of morphological complexity in the data. So, as uh, we have already talked about uh, in the uh, lecture on phonological alternations, um, the UR or the underlying representation It is not there on the surface, so it is not surface apparent and therefore it is also known as hidden structure which has to be uh, always discovered in a data set. So it is not something which is phonetically realized and therefore it must be inferred from the surface representations as what you see in the data as your consonant and vowel combinations uh, that is your surface representation and the UR has to be inferred from this data. So, the UR is not there in the data that is presented to you or not there when you hear speech that is not the underlying representations that you hear. So, in a phonological analysis you try to understand hidden structures. So, um, again as we have discussed before, uh, the underlying representation of a morpheme contains only the unpredictable morphological information about that morpheme and the information is unpredictable. But how do we know which information is predictable and which information is not predictable? And the answer is entirely in the in analysis and we will see in more detail today how we can proceed with that analysis. When we talk about alternations, both phonological alternations and morphophonological alternations, something which is of utmost importance is rule ordering. When there are multiple rules in the data, we have to decide if these rules interact with each other, how to order those rules to arrive at the correct outcome. So, when you are doing an analysis, phonological analysis, we not only find out rules, we also have to find out if there are to analyze a given set of data, we need more than one rule and if we have more than one rule, do they need ordering? Is it necessary to place one rule before another rule so that one rule applies before the other rule and um, what is the order of two given rules? And if they have to be ordered, that means that the rules interact for the given set of data. So, um, we will um, not talk about phonological alternations now. We will talk about morphophonemic analysis. And what is a morphophonemic analysis? It seeks to, what does it do? It seeks to establish a connection between the data and theory and of course, uh, because it is about morphophonemic analysis, it is about it is data phonological data with uh, morphological complexity. And the purpose of morphophonemic analysis is to discover a set of underlying forms and ordered rules that is consistent with the data. So, uh, as we just discussed, 
the two important things here would be underlying forms and ordered rules. And uh, complex patterns are can be described with great simplicity if we uh, find the underlying patterns, the underlying forms and see how rules are applying to those forms to give us the surface representations. And morphophonemic analysis may be contrasted with phonemic analysis which we looked at in the previous lectures. What happens in the phonemic analysis? It is only about phones and phonemes, but morphophonemic analysis involves morphological complexity data which is morphologically complex. Uh, what is the procedure for morphophonemic analysis? We have to of course examine the data, we have to look at the glasses and make provisional division of the forms into morphemes. So, we have to make some what is known as morpheme cuts. And find each morpheme that alternates and locate all of its allomorphs. So, also we have to see if there is alternation in data. And within each allomorph, locate the particular segment or segments that alternate. And uh, once we find the allomorphs, we have to locate the regularity of a process. We have to look at the segments which are alternating. And then we have to set up the underlying representations so that all the allomorphs of each morpheme can be derived from a single underlying representation. Remember, this is like what we did for phonemic analysis, but here this has to be extended to morphemes, um, to more than one morpheme in a word. So, like um, any analysis, here also uh, we have to do some pre processing. So, how do you pre-process the data? Uh, it is always easier to do more phonemic analysis with data that are already expressed as phonemes. So, if they are not, then uh, there is some further difficulty there. And we have to make the morpheme division, the morpheme cuts, and we have to break up the forms into their component morphemes, not just the phonemes, remember the morphemes. And as the words are divided into morphemes, it is possible to state and order the rules of morphology that are active. And uh, setting up of underlying representations is uh, the problem of choosing underlying representations often involve uh, considering more than one hypothesis. And suppose segment A alternates with segment B in the data, the analysis should consider two possibilities. Uh, segment A, segments showing alternation A, B alternation unlikely A, which is converted to B in certain context, the rules apply and become B by one or more phonological rules. And this is one possibility that what is the unit, what is the unit which is changing? It is A which is changing to B. This is one possibility as is the case with all phonological rules. If there is alternation, something changes to something else. And um, segments, or the other possibility is that when you see an alternation, that A, B alternation, the other possibility is that the underlying segment is not A, but it is B, which stays as B and in its context, uh, but is uh, converted to A in certain other contexts by one or more phonological rules. So, we have some data from Jim Winnie, all the data analysis is from Hayes 2009. So, uh, Jim Winnie has many instances of long vowels alternating with short. So, we have the data of um, we have the soma to read and somo or to be read. Now, uh, we have this long vowel here, we have this long vowel here this long vowel here is shortened. So, now the problem in front of us is that we have two versions of the vowel O here, right. So, we have to now find out from the data if this or this is the underlying 
representation. So, which one is the underlying form? Is it underlined a long vowel or is it underlined a short O? How do we find out this from the data? So, that is how always questions are put before you when we have phonological data that what is the form which is alternating and to find out the form which is alternating we have to find out the underlying form. So, suppose we consider that the underlying form is a short vowel. So, which means as a rule applies that all long vowels will become short in this context. So, underlying we have a long vowel as in hasoma and this is becoming short as in some ova because of the uh, addition of other morphemes here and the phonological context which is provided by that morpheme. So, the question that we have in front of us is it shortening or is it lengthening? So, uh, the two words that we have in front of us shows that in one context we have a long vowel and in one context we have a short vowel. So, this is our short vowel, this is our long vowel. Now, what is inducing this change? So, if it is an underlyingly long vowel, then we have a shortening. If it is underlyingly a short vowel, then it is lengthening. So, if it is an underlyingly short vowel, this is som. If it is underlyingly long vowel, then it is som. So, it is a shortening rule, but how do we find out that uh, it is so? There is no algorithm as such in phonology to find out uh, the underlying forms, but there are tried and tested methods of um, analysis. So, uh, constructing underlying representations under a particular hypothesis. A recommended procedure to construct underlying representations, uh, segments do not alternate that do not alternate can be assumed phonemically identical assumed to be phonemically identical in their underlying representation to their surface representation. So, one as we just said the tried and tested things one of them is that we often find segments which do not alternate. So, if there is no alternation if for instance the language x and in that language R lengthens or A lengthens, but we have R and A, but uh, we, we never find E or U lengthening in this language X, then we can be pretty much sure that this is identical. So, E and U, we never find E and U in any context to have lengthened. So, then we can be pretty much sure that they are identical to their underlying representation. Basically, no alternation means that there are no changes involved from A to B. For segments that alternate, follow the hypothesis you made about underlying forms, implementing it consistently through the data. That is another important aspect that you not only have to apply your underlying forms to all the forms where it is alternating, but in all the forms where they are not alternating also to check whether there is any wrong predictions. So, um, hence we have to check underlying forms that we construct for the uh, an entire set of data and not just for the forms which where we see the alternations. So, be sure that underlying representation of each morpheme is uniform throughout its paradigm. So, you cannot have multiple underlying forms for the same uh, surface form, but then there are other issues there which we will talk about. There can be sometimes underlying forms which are different underlying forms for similar surface forms, but uh, that is another uh, thing altogether. But here what we are talking about is that, that there should be uniform underlying forms. So, you cannot uh, change the underlying form or else you will be predicting uh, different uh, surface forms. And then uh, we have to work out the rules. So, we have to arrange a suitable set of hypothesized underlying forms and align their corresponding surface forms underneath them. And suppose uh, we take these forms now with this Chimwini data that we just saw some time back where we saw lengths in vowels. Now, we have SOM which is lengthening here, here and we have a long uh, A 
and we add our rules we add our rules the rules uh, let's for the time being um, not uh, tell you what the rules are and then we get all these surface forms so uh, what happened here um, here we have the same form here as in a length in O and here um, unlike uh, that word here we have a long O but we have a shortening here and we are not telling you the rule what exactly it is but because we have put the same underlying form because of the application of the rule now we can get these correct forms. Now clue for choosing underlying representations there is often a clue in the data to guide you that is contextually limited contrast. And while vowel length is uh, phonemic in Chimwini, only short vowels are allowed uh, when more than three syllables from the end of the phrase or when a long vowel fo follows. So what is happening in Chimwini? We showed you in a few slides before that uh, there are long as well as short versions of the same vowel and what seems to be the same morpheme in one place we have the longer vowel in one in, in the same place we have a shorter vowel. So context contextually determined contrast is something which is contextually governed contrast is uh, something which is found quite often in phonological data. So what happens in Chimwini is that while vowel length is phonemic which means there is a contrast between long and short A's and long and short O's uh, contrastive but this contextually governed contrast the contrast is not found everywhere. So short vowels are allowed when more than three syllables when there are more than three syllables from the end of the phrase or when a long vowel follows. So what happens in our data here so we have a long vowel following this so this vowel is shortened again this underlying long a we have how many syllables we have one two three syllables following it and that's why again this is shortened so there are long and short vowels in Chimwini, but the long vowels can become short because of certain context. The context of the following long vowel or um, three syllables from the end of the word, presence of more than three syllables from the end of the phrase. So, such limitations are a strong clue that there must be a rule that wipes out the contrast in these environments. So, now the contrast is not allowed to be seen in certain contexts. It is governed by uh, the contrast is taken away or wiped away or removed in, a, in certain positions. And we just now saw what they are. There is a following long vowel or more than three syllables from the end of the phrase. So that is the limitation here. The long vowel's appearance in all positions can be curtailed by such contexts. And the uh, finally the isolation form shortcut. The unlined form of a stem is the way that the stem appears in isolation taking away the effects of any allophonic rule. So the unlined form so one of the hypotheses of the unlined form is that um, it is the it is the one that appears in isolation we will see how that works out. In languages like English stems frequently appear alone. So as in plant, uh, plan, planning, we have a T deletion there. Neutralization rules could apply just in case no affix is added uh, to a stem. So the isolation form that is here the plant and that is occurring with its underlying form. But when we have affixes added then we have uh, we can have what's happened here to plant plan planting. So the affix uh, protects the rule from the neutralizing rule. So neutralizing phonological rules are often conditioned by the word edge that is uh, they have environments like word. 
and uh, when an fx is present a stem will be buffered by the fx and the crucial rule will not apply. So, let us see of this example of Lardel. Lardel is an Australian Aboriginal language spoken on uh, Mornington Island. So, uh, the Lardel segment inventory is such that there is four contrasting vowel qualities each occurring in short and long versions. The consonant system of Lardel has four different types of coronal consonants as well. So, these are the Lardel vowels. We have a long E short E, long U short U, long A e short A e, and long A uh, short A. Uh. So, we have uh, various contrasts in the consonant inventory as well. We have apicoalveolar turner and apicopalatal sort of retroflex consonants and laminodental context and laminopalatal and velar consonants as well. So, what we saw from the feature inventory in our previous lecture, we saw that among coronal consonants we can divide them into uh, the distributed minus distributed can be anterior or my <coughs> uh, plus anterior or minus anterior where the minus anterior could be the ones which are palatalized like chia and nya and the plus anterior ones are the dental ones the laminodental ones and the plus uh, anterior minus distributed ones are also the retroflex consonants. So, what is important to note here is that among the uh, coronal set, we have both minus distributed and plus distributed where we have alveolar and retroflexes which are minus distributed and which are both plus anterior as well, but in the plus distributed set we have the dental and the uh, palatalized uh, consonants. So, a uh, big inventory of coronal consonants in Lardale which can be divided based on their uh, featural properties of minus distributed, plus distributed and plus and minus anterior. So, data um, analysis of Lardil, we can see that Lardil nouns inflect for tense in agreement with the verb and the two inflected forms the accusative non future and the accusative future. So, um, we can see that the uninflected forms do not have any affixes and the accusative non future has uh, these affixes and the accusative future has these. Okay. So, now let us see what morphological rules that we have in Lardil. In Lardil when we have noun and accusative minus future we have this morpheme, when you have noun uh, plus accusative plus future we have uh, this morpheme. Okay. Now, with that knowledge let us move on and look at more data from Lardil. So, what we see that in the uninflected form we have one f x here, um, we have one sort of change there which we did not see in the data uh, previously. So, we did not see a final r in the uninflected forms okay. and also here because we have r now interesting things are happening here, we do not get the e here and we do not get the, the central vowel here. Uh, those are missing in the accusative non future and accusative future. So, uh, we have now as you remember from your English uh, data where we discussed allomorphs. Now, we have allomorphs in Lardil. So, we have in versus na and r and and just a r. So, we have these two allomorphs for the accusative non future and accusative future we have these two allomorphs. So, another um, common thing that is seen in languages is that when we have a vowel ending and then the following suffix also ends in vowel then there is deletion there may be deletion of one of the vowels because the structure where two vowels occur in uh, the same place is often avoided in languages and languages try to have one syllable there instead of two. So, vowel initial um, syllables are avoided most of the time and that is why we have a uh, vowel deletion and that is why also we can see that e and o, o are deleted because the final r in the uninflected form. Okay. 
Now that is one way of thinking about the data that the E and O are deleted. What is the other way of um, uh, thinking about this? That this N and uh, this rhotic they are the underlying forms. So, which is the underlying form this one or this one? Okay. Now, we can work with both the hypotheses to see which one uh, is effective to help us analyze the data uh, that we have. So, to verify that let us now uh, have our um, fxs with the vowels across all the forms. So, remember when you said that you have to use the same uh, underlying form across all your data that is what we are doing now. And now, when we do that and we have to add our rule x which says that remove the vowel uh, two vowels uh, two consecutive vowels and let us see whether we get our surface forms. So, we get the surface forms we add this rule we uh, apply this rule and we get we get our surface forms. So, we are saying that this is a rule of deletion. So, delete a vowel and in a situation where it is where there are two vowels one after the other delete a vowel after a vowel. Okay. The other option with us is that the hypothesis 2 that the underlying form does not have the vowel the underlying affix does not have the vowel and the vowel is inserted because of two consonants occurring together. So, now uh, when we do that what do we get? So, if we say insert a vowel if there are two consonants uh, together then we would get these forms as before. Now, there seems to be no principal basis for making this prediction. While we have no trouble where the vowel should go breaks up what final constant sequences there is still a problem determining which vowel should be inserted is it E or O. Now, that is a crucial question here how did we know that we have to insert E here versus we have to insert O here there is nothing in the environment telling us that there should one should be E one should be O. While there is nothing wrong in saying that we have to insert a vowel between two consonants because two consecutive consonants are they are not possible in the coda position in this language, but that is a possible way of explaining this, but still we do not have any way of explanation of why we get two different vowels. And uh, something that you can remember that in languages there is always um, if, if a vowel is a pentatic then the vowel would be the same in all the forms. Now, uh, we have all these forms that you see here and the data deals with the alternation of R and O and two analysis to be considered. The underlying forms of stems might be the same as the isolation form that is muka kata ngawa and uh, if we add U in nukun, so we get the form nukun. So, suppose we have the rule of vowel deletion there unlike what is said uh, the other hypothesis that we entertain of insertion if we do not entertain it anymore and we have this rule of vowel deletion and then we have a rule of, of U insertion then we uh, can explain why we get uh, nukun here as we see in this new data that we have of Lardil. So far our Lardil data had these words. So, we had Melan, Wakan, Kunkan, uh, Kunkar, Melar etcetera. Now, we have this data where we are using the where we can now consider the vowel deletion rule to be applicable, but we have some more complexity here. So, what is happening here is that we do not get either this vowel or this vowel and we get a different vowel, which is uh, not uh, the case in this word. So, here wanka in is the rule of all deletion applies correctly we get wankan, but in the final surface form uh, it stays wankan. the intermediate rule here that we have of rule x does not uh, apply here it does not apply, but it applies here. So, what more is happening in Ladil apart from vowel deletion? So, 
Rule X converts Ngukan to Ngukun but fails to convert Wangkan to Wangkun. So something to note here is that the two vowels here are different whereas the two vowels here are the same. So what's faced with the failure from the R to U direction for the rule we can try the U to R direction. So now let us add some more interesting analysis to the larger data and see what if we instead of trying to say that R goes to U, why do not we think that U goes to R. So okay. So let us think that the data we have is, is not nuka but nuku. Okay. So, so which means our underlying form is nuku. And uh, as a result, what we are supposed to get, we get nuku uh, nukun and finally we get nukun. And uh, whereas wanka is wanka, wanka does not have to be change because the final form is also wankan. So, there is no uh, problem in this derivation with a wankan, but the problem with is with the derivation with no ku because in one form we get no ka, in another form we get uh, no kun. So, we can draw a distinction between this set and this set no ku and wanka where uh, here we get one form is no ka and one form is no kun whereas wanka and wankan remains the same. So, again we can say that Lardil has uh, something called final lowering U change goes to R in the final word position as you see in this word in Muka. So, U lowers to R and, and so we get Muka. Lower U to R if it occurs at the end of a word. Now, actually we need more data to, to see what is happening in Lardil with the data that we have seen so far we will not be able to say if there is final lowering in Lardil or not. So, there is final lowering in Lardil how do we know that? Uh, look at this data that we have in front of us. So, we have uh, Kente, we have Nine, we have Pape, we have Kentin, we have um, Ningin, we have Papin, we have Kenti War, we have Ningin War and we have Papi War. Okay, so when we have can't, which is the underived uh, form, um, can't a note that when the form is can't a in the accusative non future, we consistently find e in the accusative future, again we consistently find e. So, which means there must be a rule of lowering, which means that the underlying e must have changed in the uninflected form. So, this Lardil data shows us something very significant. It shows us that uh, morphemes here can appear in different shapes and you can see the underlying form in a, a derived form and in the inflected form you can see the underlying form and not in the uninflected form. In the uninflected form we have further phonological rule applying. So, as a result, the data supports the hypothesis that final lowering is a rule of Lardil phonology. As we can see in the uninflected forms, uh, we do not have the E, we have A which means a lower vowel. So, there is an alternation between a low and high vowel A, E as we have just discussed. And there is also another alternation with vo appearing in the uh, accusative future suffix. So, what is final lowering? Uh, vowel becomes a uh, low this is minus high and low and minus back minus round in the word final position as shown by this the way this is written as we have discussed rule writing before. So, this rule changes round so that U will become unrounded. So, the U becomes unrounded and as a result we have changed to E in the accusative future also. So, this rule which changes U to unrounded, it does not affect E which is already minus round and minus back. So, now looking at the Lardil data, we have a couple of rules to uh, work with. So, now we have initially if you recall we have the first we found that there is vowel deletion in Lardil and then we found that there is vowel lowering in Lardil. 
and then we as a result of post vowel deletion and vowel lowering we have forms like pape appears as pape and papin two e's appears with only one papin and similarly in vite in we have viten where e is deleted the e which unlinely was there in the morpheme is deleted so after stems ending unlinely in e the accusative future uh, ending ur shows up with the alum of ur where did we see that again let's go back to the data uh, which we did not discuss then when we talked about akenti so recall that now we have vur in this data uh, recall sorry recall that earlier in the data we did not see a wa there so let us look at uh, the ur data that we discussed before yes so we here either we have the r or we have as in ur here okay but this form that we see here is uh, new in the data wor why do we have the glide there before the u and that is what we are discussing here now after we have gone through vowel deletion final lowering two steps to one gives us forms like pape and the other gives us forms like papin now uh, we have the rule of wor insertion in lardil so when do we get wor in the wor alarm of so when do we get that we get that when we have e then there's a u insertion in the suffix uh, or and as a result we also have the third rule that is a parenthesis of wor by the following rules so wor as in now goes to wor if there's a preceding e and following u insert wor between e and u now we have our third rule of lardil so like vowel deletion this can be seen as a mm, what is called hiatus resolution what does hiatus resolution rules do so if there are two consecutive vowels and as a result we can have two syllables ending in one vowel starting with another uh, most of the time this sort of hiatus is resolved by any language by either deletion of one of the vowels deletion of one of the vowels or a parenthesis so something is inserted between the two vowels and this is also a case of hiatus resolution and languages resolve high vowel hiatus by inserting a glide that is homorganic with one of the two adjacent vowels and why parenthesis must be ordered before vowel deletion in case the hiatus is u why parenthesis gets the first chance resolving it as u now we have to deal with a rule ordering when is a parenthesis ordered vis-a-vis -vis deletion if we have a context e and u if either of the vowels are deleted in a vv context then there is no need for the application of the parenthesis rule if either this is deleted if either e is deleted or if either u is deleted the context for parenthesis is not there and hence parenthesis must be ordered before the deletion of these rules so once parenthesis occurs how vowel deletion is blocked so now uh, we have four rules for um, four vowel phonemes of lardil e a u a u and a what is our first rule now we just talked about parenthesis how do we know parenthesis occurs before vowel deletion because if there is vowel deletion then the context for the application of the rule of parenthesis is not there it does not exist hence it has to occur first so we have a context for the application of this rule of the rule of parenthesis e u so something has to be inserted here and we get the wa in uh, lardil so we have wa parenthesis 
We have then vowel deletion as we just talked about epenthesis should be ordered before deletion. If deletion was before vowel epenthesis then in a word like papiur uh, there would have been no epenthesis because uh, then just like in papi in the e would have been deleted and uh, we would just get papiur and not papi wor. Then we have the rule of final lowering if this vowel is in the final word final position the high vowel does not occur in that position it is a it is lowered and then we have our surface forms. Now we can see the the surface forms of we see the underlying forms of another set let us apply all these rules that we have just found the parenthesis deletion final lowering of lardil with another set of uh, data and see how it works. So, we have w were epenthesis is there any context for the application of epenthesis remember e epenthesis occurs only when there is a context of two vowels e and u in lardil. So, we do not have that context here. So, w epenthesis were epenthesis does not occur and then we have vowel deletion we have many contexts for vowel deletion. So, this 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 and this and we will see that vowel deletion applies in all those contexts. And then we have our final lowering which can only apply here which is the high vowel and u becomes a and as a result we have the surface forms nguka, ngukun, ngukur, wanka, wanka and wankar. So, continuing with lardil there is more data in lardil which can be discussed. So, we have again the uninflected forms with final consonant and then we have the accusative non future with pa ka tu and ka pa tu as one of the extensions of yukar, yukar pan, ulunkan, kantu kantun, yukar par and wulunkar and kantu kantur. Okay. The data shows vowel zero alternations but also consonant zero alternations. So, what happens when you see vowel zero alternations is that here all this is missing in the uninflected form. So, in the uninflected forms we see a considerable part of the form what we think underlying form to be missing. So, so similarly it is not just vowel 0, so it is not just a vowel which is missing it is both the it is a consonant also which is missing. So, it is unlikely that the consonants could be derived by insertion since there are different consonants that alternate. So, pakata or the environment for inserting different consonants would be possible to state and the best analytic procedure is to set up the most likely underlying forms run them through the rules. So, we predict then that as we talked about this. So, we predict then the pa and the ka and the two appear are there in the underlying forms. Okay. So, if we posit that as one of our hypotheses then what do we get? So, if we have ka epenthesis, wa epenthesis then we have and the vowel deletion and final lowering and then insertion we get a surface form which is difficult to analyze. If all our rules of vowel deletion if you recall the two vowels um, one will be deleted our rule of epenthesis our rule of, of final lowering if they all apply uh, along with the pocopy if they all apply then our predicted surface forms would be not what we uh, so eucarp is not the uh, output form in eucarp pa. So, this is which is fallen foul in our analysis. So, the analysis works except where it generates eucarp instead of the work correct form and apocopy applies freely to words of sufficient length. So, when it creates a final consonant cluster further rule eliminates the cluster by deleting the second member. Apocopy is applying freely is what we were trying to say and it also eliminates the cluster by deleting the second member. So, we have cluster reduction where 
C is completely deleted in a final word. So, delete a final consonant, word final consonant when it is preceded by a consonant. So, now when we apply the apocope rule properly, then uh, uh, followed by a cluster reduction, then we get these surface forms. So, cluster reduction must be ordered after apocope since it is apocope that exposes that the consonant cluster to word final position. So, uh, because of consonant 0, uh, we do not see these forms in the uninflected form and as a result, we need more rules of and cluster reduction to arrive at our surface forms here. So, um, lateral stems alternate in a drastic way, but the system is fundamentally a simple one. The pattern of alternation reduces to a set of phonological rules applied to the output of the morphological component and this part is very important that alternation reduces uh, to a set of phonological rules. So, these are all phonological rules which are applying to the morpho output of the morphological component and also that lateral is an illustration of the fact that isolation form the shortcut does not always work. So, that is something we have been talking about that the isolation form will not give us the inflected form will not give us the underlying forms. So, so, we have to look at the entire paradigm to get our underlying forms. Mm -hmm.